Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to finally be presenting at ALTA. Um, tried a few times in recent years and not quite managed it. Um, shame I can't be with you all, uh, but I'm here in Brazil at our site uh, to, to give you a bit of an update on the POE Nickel project. So what am I going to talk about today? Um, I'll talk a little bit about heat bleaching of nickel laterites. Uh, I think anybody who knows us knows that's what uh, that is our process of choice. Um, I'm also going to uh, discuss the current status of the POE Nickel project, uh, both our small production unit, which we call the PMP 1000, and the current status of, of our full scale project. I'll touch a little bit on ESG, uh, and I'll also talk a little bit about, uh, in connection with ESG, our, our CO2 current emissions. Uh, and what our future reduction plans are. So, you know, why heat leaching? And we, you know, I've, I've been looking at this now for, uh, for over 20 years, the heat leaching of nickel laterites. Uh, and, and from all the work that we've done, um, you know, it, it's by far the lowest capital cost of, of any of the hydromet processes. Um, the operating costs are also low, they're first quartile. Uh, it's much faster to full capacity uh, because while it might be a slow process, you know, basically it's a very mapped out process. Every time a new module of ore goes on the heat leach, you get closer to full capacity. So you know what that ramp up is. And once you've achieved uh, the, the, the design criteria numbers of modules, you're then at your full capacity. Um, it's a simple, flexible process, but it does need know-how. And I think more importantly today than ever, um, increased resource utilization, uh, basically anything above a, a cutoff grade uh, goes onto the heap. Uh, and we don't need to, you know, we don't need to do any blending or there's no, you know, we don't have rejects uh, because they can't go through the process. It's also lower energy intensity uh, than most other processes uh, because of course it's all the ambient conditions. And therefore, it tends also to be lower CO2. All residues are dry as well, so we have no tailings down. Uh, and obviously, that's, uh, that's a bonus, particularly here in well, anywhere in the world, but particularly here in Brazil after some of the uh, recent iron ore tailings dam failures that there have been of late. So therefore, overall, it, it's, a, it's a lower risk process um, to choose uh, to to treat a nickel laterite. So, you know, perhaps just to go back a touch and, and talk about the, the nickel laterite heat bleaching development, just from Brazilian nickel's point of view, um, we bring together a team of experts that basically have been at the forefront of the development of nickel laterite heat bleaching. Um, we, we began, um, you know, way back, um, myself and, and, and Mike, uh, you know, with others in, in the European nickel days, looking at uh, basically the European laterite deposits. So we, we looked in Albania, we, we did a lot of work there, and, and then we took the, the Chaldar nickel project in Turkey, basically to, uh, to the point of uh, full-scale construction. Um, there were many reasons why that project in the end didn't go ahead, mostly to do with a with permitting situation. Um, and then at the same time, you know, BHP, who owned Ceramatoso then, now South 32, were also doing piloting work, which um, I was heavily involved in. We, we worked together in those days to, uh, to take the nickel heap leaching forward. Uh, they also did uh, some serious uh, pilot plant work. Uh, and got to the point of, of a bankable to, to have basically a, a, an extra feed for their ferro-nickel smelter. We then went off and looked at some um, Philippine laterites and started looking at heat bleaching there. Uh, and then finally, you know, in, in 2010, basically, you know, we set up a, a new company looking to further commercialize the heat bleaching of nickel laterites. Uh, and, and then we went out to, to secure the POE nickel project in Brazil. 
<laughs> and since then, we, we ran a dam implant uh, and we're now at the point of, of BFS. Um, so there's been a lot of work done basically over the last uh, 23 years, unbelievably, but yes. Um, and I'll come a bit more detail on, on some of those projects as, as we go forward. So this is basically, you know, a, a schematic view of, of our process. Um, it is a counter current leach that we do. It's been optimized over the years so that basically the PLS we produce is, is the highest possible nickel, lowest possible impurities and lowest possible acid that then goes and feeds straightforward solid liquid separation technology. You know, we, we use, uh, like we simply raise the pH as we go through the downstream plant. We use limestone uh, to precipitate those impurities. Uh, we then choose to use a, an ion exchange uh, system. So we produce a, a separate nickel and cobalt product rather than a straight MHP. Um, there's many reasons for doing that for us. It's, uh, yeah, it concentrates the solutions. It gives us a much purer product, much better for transportation. But it also, because the concentrated solutions, reduces the size of that downstream plant. Um, we do have what we call a bleed precipitation circuit uh, where we keep the magnesium levels um, to the right level throughout the process so that when we send the raffinate back to uh, the leaching process, um, the magnesium levels are, are at a set amount and they don't then interfere with any heat leaching. So this is our, the demo plant. Um, results, um, going back to that, we, when we purchased the, um, the POE nickel project of Vale, uh, we operated um, a demonstration plant. Um, Vale had actually built um, a pilot plant after visiting us in Turkey. Um, they got some interesting results and all worked quite well. Um, but we took that plant and, and changed it into a true demonstration plant. There was quite a lot of things that needed to be changed. Um, but from 2016 to 2017, we operated heaps continuously. Um, we ran three heaps in basically three modes. So heap zero, we called it zero because basically it was a sacrificial heap to create intermediate leach solution. And we could then do um, heap one, which was uh, our basically our commercial demonstration. In, in the countercurrent mode that we would do in the full scale operation. And then we, we stacked a, a, a third heat, which we called heat two. And we use that purely to neutralize the solution from heat one uh, to create a PLS, which we then fed to our downstream plant to produce product. And also use that solution to, to pilot the, um, to, to run a pilot ion exchange um, which was, um, you know, to, to produce the, the purer products and the separation of the products. Now you can see those are the heaps um, actually taken. That photo was taken just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so they're still standing. Um, you can actually see some, uh, some tracks here where we've, we've run with, uh, equipment up on the top to take solid sampling for, uh, for residue analysis, not, not for mass balance closing. Um, but so the heaps are very stable, you know, and they've been there now more than five years. Um, but we have more than 80% uh, nickel extraction for, for good acid consumption. You know, the heaps showed excellent percolation and stability. Um, we've had plenty of, of, you know, heavy rainfall in the wet season. We're not in Amazon, so we don't have a huge amount of rain in POE. Um, but we do have quite heavy rain when it comes. Uh, and there was no degradation of heaps when that occurred. Um, I mean, you can see there from the, the fairly traditional way of measuring nickel extracted days under leach. You know, it might appear that the uh, heap zero might be the best way to go because it appears to, with a single pass, uh, have a faster leaching. But when you look at the graph below, you know, the basically the kilograms of nickel extracted per kilogram of acid consumed it becomes very apparent that uh, the countercurrent method used for heat one and what we will use for our full scale operation is a much more efficient method uh, of extracting the nickel for acid used. You know, and, and heat two there, there was never any fresh acid put onto that heap. So that's also quite an interesting curve to see. 
So if we move on, almost a bit of a step back, actually, we talk now, uh, I'll talk a bit more about the POE Nickel project itself. Um, as I said previously, you know, we acquired uh, the project from Vale back in January 2014. They'd already spent a lot of money uh, on the project, um, fully drilled, uh, up to, you know, a, a large percentage measured, and also um, they built that uh, uh, they built their pilot plant, which we uh, we renamed a demonstration plant um, because we weren't piloting anymore. Uh, but yes, so uh, you know, good providence of the project. Um, it's an advanced stage project. Even when we bought it, it was already advanced. It does have very favourable geology. Uh, I, as people who know me, I believe you can le heat leach any nickel laterite, irrespective of the geology or the physical characteristics. But this project is a particularly good um, project for certainly for the first standalone heat leach. Uh, I know there's still some skeptics out there, um, but yeah, so it is a um, it's a very rocky, um, siliceous, very high silica, in fact, um, project. Uh, and that high silica, of course, it aids percolation. It gives us even more stability, and of course, minimizes acid consumption. Um, it's straightforward mining. The project is actually a low hill, um, so we can uh, the mining can be attacked from various different places. We're, we're not limited, uh, and and the the, my, the current mine life is a 31 year mine life. But it's now been extensively tested. So you know the, those heaps you saw on the previous slide, 8,000 tons of ore. Uh, the heaps are full height. Um, we've also tested an awful lot of large columns and we produced MHP, uh, which was sold. Um, the iron exchange plant was operated producing NHP as well, but that was on a much smaller scale. I mean, with fast leaching kinetics, it's high nickel extraction, as you saw from the slide before, uh, and low acid consumption, uh, with, which basically you know, leads to uh, a very good project with very robust economics. Let's touch now on the other aspects which, which make this a great project. Um, I mean, it's in Brazil, obviously, um, so, which has a very well established mining jurisdiction. Uh, we have excellent support from the POE state government. Uh, POE is, is probably the poorest state in Brazil. Uh, and, and as such, this project will, will make a huge difference to the local population. Uh, and the, therefore, the POE state government are very supportive and, and they really want to see the project go ahead. Um, there's a, interestingly now, the, there's a lot of renewable projects in that area because it's the, obviously there's, it's, it's a very sunny place, um, but also there's a lot of wind farms. And so the whole renewable um, sector is there uh, and our project also fits very well with that. Um, I mean, there's a good road infrastructure. It's actually been significantly improved since we were first at the project. Uh, you can see that road in picture four is, um, is, is the road to our site that runs within 15 kilometers of the project. It's a paved road, uh, and that was one of the areas of, um, of, of state government support. Um, the local community is highly engaged. 74% um, of our workforce is, is currently local. Uh, and by local, we mean the, basically there are two small towns near us. Uh, and a small city of about 30,000 people uh, and our workforce, the majority of which come from the two small towns uh, very close to us at the moment. Um, it, the resources I mentioned before is an isolated hill. You can see that in, um, in picture one. Um, so it's mineable from the surface. Uh, in front of it there, you can see uh, an awful lot of flat land, which obviously we, we need, the, the flatter the better for a heat leach. Uh, it, it makes this good for heap. It's, it's, the climate there is interesting. You know, people associate Brazil and a lot of their mining projects as being Amazonian or close to Amazon, the Amazon. And you know, we're not at all. So we actually have extremely low rainfall, uh, but interestingly, ample process water available. Uh, picture two there is, is a, um, a dammed, actually the, the river Piauí that's been dammed um, to produce um, well, originally as a reservoir for the local town, interestingly, it's never been used. <laughs> uh, 
1967, they built the dam, the Jenny Papo Dam, uh, and then they realized that uh, Saja de Pioui was sat on a, a very large aquifer, so they, they've never used it. So, you know, we will take our water from there. It's about 30 kilometers away. Uh, and and our, the, the, the recharge capacity, um, we're less than um, half a percent of that recharge capacity per year. Um, the infrastructure is good. I've already touched on the roads, but we also have power. Um, that's a very large substation. That's also about 35 kilometers from us. It was already large because it actually gathers power from a lot of the hydropower in the area. And it's been expanded recently as well to take on board the new uh, three or four solar farms, which are some of the largest in the world, uh, and, and wind farms in the area as well. And we also have a choice of ports um, for our imports and exports. So the, the POE Nickel project itself, uh, the current status of the project we have an early production unit in construction at the moment. Uh, you can see that there in the photograph. Um, and we are in the very, very final stages of completing our bankable feasibility study. We've basically issued a, a final draft for internal review. Uh, so we're expecting to issue that um, in early June. The full scale project will have a, an average of, of 25,000 tonnes per annum of nickel contained in the NHP uh, and we'll also have uh, approximately 900 tonnes per annum of cobalt in a separate cobalt hydroxide product. Uh, we have all environmental permits awarded uh, for, for both projects. I mean the map there is just, uh, just shows you where POE is uh, in, in the context of Brazil as well. So let's talk about the PMP 1000. Um, we set this up as a bit of a fast track to producer, producer status, you know, albeit at a small scale. But basically, we, we look to convert that existing demonstration plant into a small production unit. And we'll be producing approximately 1500 tonnes per annum of nickel in NHP and 40 tonnes per annum of cobalt in the, the cobalt hydroxide product. It uses the existing mining rights that we already have. Uh, and it is fully permitted, op operation license included to, to start. Um, we had a, a 23 million capex working capital um, budget, uh, and we've managed to, um, to be pretty much on time and pretty much on budget, both within about uh, five or six percent, even doing all of this uh, with COVID restrictions. Um, I mean, there's many benefits of, of the PMP 1000. Um, one of the big ones at the moment is that developing a customer portfolio with the, obviously this product will go towards the electric vehicle market uh, and that is a supply chain very much in flux. Um, so we can work with our customers uh, to, to come up with the, you know, the best fit for what they need uh, and what we can do at our site using the PMP 1000. Obviously, it provides us cash flow, and as a junior miner, that's, um, that's very relevant. And it enhances various industrial partnership opportunities. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, you know, um, you know this, this is, the workforce is very important here. Uh, we're currently, we're in construction at the moment, so we still have about 350 people on site. But we'll be about 225 when this is operating, and 75% of those are local at the moment. And so it's a great opportunity for workforce development and training of the local population. And we actually set up with the POE, the local um, officials actually, but of the POE state, uh, a training program where we opened it up to, um, to anybody who wanted to, to enter. We had about uh, a thousand um, applications as it happened um, but we took uh, 160 of those and, and 80 of the 160 that did the training course are now our operators many of them have never worked in industry before uh, but that's one of the benefits again of, of the heat bleach operation uh, it is a simple much simpler industrial process than some other laterite processes um, so a quick look at the schedule there so um, we kicked off in January last year uh, we took us 12 months to be ready to, uh, you know, to start mining for the heaps. 
Uh, we stacked the first module um, in, in March and we're expecting our first nickel product in, in June, at uh, the end of June. So, yeah. Now, as I can't be with you, um, I, and I am here at the site, I thought I might take uh, just take the opportunity to show a few photos uh, and a little video of some of the, the work that's actually going on at the moment. So this basically is a, the stacking, which is going on at the moment. Not very exciting, but uh, but it's um, it's important for us. And and you can see uh, you know the agglomerates uh, running down the, the the side of the heap there as it's being stacked. And then this is our downstream plants. You know, what one of our impurity removal thickeners there. Um, the final work going on 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 that also is happening this week. Um, the heaps. Uh, this we've now stacked uh, two modules, uh, and we're beginning. We will be beginning the third module stacking. Um, you know, on, on as as we speak. Uh, so all of this is on track for the, the first nickel production um, at the end of next month. Again, a bit of an overview of the plant. Um, it, the heaps here are the old demonstration heaps, which, which we will just leave. And then we have the new pad area over here uh, and our, our downstream plant, which is just simply um, pH raising uh, at each step to first remove the impurities uh, and then precipitate out the nickel and cobalt products. So if we move on to uh, a little bit about um, perhaps the development of, of where we've come from and, and where we're moving, um, I'll run through this uh, rather quickly. Um, as I said, we purchased a product in 2014 and an awful lot has been done since then. Um, we started the, the final phase of the BFS last year uh, and, and we're close to publishing that at the moment. Uh, obviously, we've been doing various fundraising uh, as we've been going along here, particularly to build um, the PMP 1000. Um, and, you know, we expect that we will be starting full scale construction in, in mid 23. Uh, and that, that is a, 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 on current estimates, is, is a two year process um, until we uh, begin the, the full scale production. Uh, and the ramp up, our, our ramp up is, is basically 12 months. Um, so by 2026, we'll be fully ramped up and producing actually at that point about 30,000 tons of nickel a year. Now, ESG is very important to us. You know, BRN's vision is ethical, carbon negative nickel and cobalt for the world. Um, you know, our, our product is going very much towards the decarbonisation of, well, the decarbonisation, the global decarbonisation, really. And therefore, our, we also need to do exactly the same. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But, you know, just very quickly, in general, you know, as I say, we, that we have the mining concession in place, all the environmental licenses are there, our water extraction permits obtained. I mean, socially, it's, it's very important for us um, because we do have, it's important to have those good relations and engagements with the local communities. Um, it's, it's very important that we have a positive social impact on, on such a poorly developed area. Um, you know, energy and CO2 is, is hugely important to the ESG. Uh, you know, we have an on-site sulfuric acid plant, of course, um, and that will, gives us carbon-free power uh, and, and excess will be sold back to the grid. And in any case, you know, our process is, is much less energy intensive than many other processes out there to produce nickel at the moment. And perhaps if we just have a, a little look at um, the, the heat leaching side of, of sort of the environmental areas. You know, the fact that it is um, a simple technology and it is at ambient conditions, it reduces the energy intensity. You, know, you could almost say we have negative energy because we produce all the energy we need from our on-site acid plants and we sell any excess power back to the grid. Um, H value of an equal size, uh, i.e. an equal amount of production, would require approximately three times the energy that we need. 
Um, there's also increased resource utilization, so much less mine waste, and therefore a longer operational life. Um, you know, we leach, we leach saprolite limonite transition material. We don't have to um, have a complicated um, separation process or um, blending or, or anything like that. It just, as I said before, if cut off, it's on the heap, yeah. Um, I mean, we've optimized this process over the years, so we minimize our water usage and our acid consumption, and we have only solid residues. Um, we've chosen the nickel hydroxide intermediate as a final product um, by being as high nickel content as possible. Um, it is much better for transport to the customer. Um, and obviously it does have to be transported. You know, the nickel mines are where they are. We, we can't change that and, and the customers are global. Um, but the local community engagement and support is also extremely important. You know, we will work with those local communities um, to leave a lasting legacy after we have gone. I'm aware I might be slightly running over now, so I'll try and speed up a little bit for these last few slides. Um, we talked about CO2, um, so we've been working with SCARN Associates um, to do some benchmarking of our projects. Um, and as I say, you know, the, the, the heat leach is inherently um, low CO2. Um, the difference there, <laughs> you know, why is the PMP 1000 so much lower than the, the full scale project is purely because we produce our own lime. Obviously, these are scope one and two emissions. Um, we have a limestone deposit where um, we will mine the limestone for the downstream and then we will convert that to hydrated lime to remove the magnesium at the end of the process uh, and that's the increase in our own scope of CO2 emissions um, for the full scale. Now we're working on reducing that so let me talk a little bit about that. That's our, our heat leach schematic that you saw before and obviously we give off CO2. So the work we're doing work with, uh, with various entities at the moment um, to catch, both capture that CO2 which isn't too difficult. Uh, we obviously give off in the full scale the CO2 from the impurity removal and also as I just said from the lime production. Um, now, in our, our raffinate is basically a magnesium sulfate solution. So theoretically, we can use that solution um, to capture the CO2 uh, and, and precipitate out uh, a stable magnesium carbonate, uh, reducing our, our CO2 hugely, um, and also removing the need for that bleed precipitation and therefore uh, reducing the amount of lime and the amount of CO2 even further. Um, so when we look at uh, the work we've, we have, we have, as I said, we have various people looking at that for us at the moment, um, some in academia, some startups, uh, they're in, in Scandinavia, in the UK, in Canada, uh, a startup we're working with has recently won um, uh, an X Prize milestone award, uh, which is great. Uh, and so we're very excited about the work we're doing there and, and it should allow us, as you see from this, uh, it allows the full scale project to drop from about 12 kilos per kilo down to um, you know, less than one. Uh, and hence our, our vision being basically carbon negative uh, nickel, because that's just capturing our own CO2. So if we start uh, reducing, um, you know, increasing the use of electric vehicles in the mine, possibly using hydrogen, uh, and one of the people we're working with, they would actually produce green hydrogen as a, as a, a byproduct of capturing our CO2. So, so it's, uh, it, we, we could very easily become you know, one of the lowest um, CO2 emitters in the industry. And if we just have a little look at laterites only, obviously sulfides, uh, the processing there, is, it tends to be lower CO2 in general. Uh, and so the, the, when we just look at the laterites, the POE project is actually the second lowest um, emitter of CO2 anyway. But if we could, that we can then start to compete with sulfide mines um, if we do our, our the, the CO2 work that we're working on at the moment. So thank you very much, everyone. 
Um, sorry, I'm not there to answer any questions. I'm sure there are lots. Um, a lot of you have my contacts. If not, you can find me on LinkedIn. If you do want to ask some questions, please feel free uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. And hopefully next year I can be there in person. Bye-bye.